There's nobody, you know, that original anyway. I mean, Mark started the band in 75 with Peter Vitelli and Phil Fight um, and Guy Sparenza. And then from the first record, there hasn't been one guy, the same lineup. It, it wasn't, a, you know, after the first two records, they switched gears. There was a different lineup, different singer. And then after the third era, there's different. The whole band was different. In the fourth era. Every way is different, except Mark, you know, and then... You've had a lot of lineup changes. Uh, has that been a problem for, for the band? Well, it's definitely been a problem. Uh, you know, uh, we've been plagued with a lot of problems, actually. You know, we never really had the right kind of guidance. We never really had the kind of people working with us that we should have in terms of business people. Um, it was just simply, a, you know, a case of, of not having good agencies and... and you know, people working with us that were capable of guiding our career. And th and that's partially, partially the reason why there were so many personal changes. It wasn't always, like, conflict within the band. It was that uh, any particular band member would become, you know, unhappy with the situation, felt like we weren't going and getting any place, basically, and they would uh, leave. You know, I bailed out, you know, for several years because I was having problems with the, you know, the, the management at the time and money and, and, like, everybody complains about. I had different reasons. It always comes down to money, so the band finally starts making a little money. Japan, we got paid. Never really happened for the band. You had more money. And the management took the money from the promoter, and I said, where's the payout? Management takes it, says, well, you owe us this. For all the money we put into you, we're taking this. We're, we're going to give each member, you know, some pittance here. And I said, whoa, wait a minute. You know, we're the one working our asses off and stuff. It, it's business is business, and that they kind of have a point. You know, they spent thousands and tens of thousands of dollars the straw that broke the camel's back was them saying, well, you have a lot of debt. We're going to keep this money. A couple hundred thousand. It's like, you know, I think they gave us chunk of stuff of like, I think Mike knows like two, three grand or something. I mean, it was ridiculous, you know. It's like, how much do you take and how much do you give? That's where a lot of the problems were. You take your percentage. That's normal. Our book, I give my booking agent 15%. You know, the uh, management takes 10%. You know, there's always stuff you look for. But when they start taking 100%, When you're doing all the work, you know, then it trying to it bums you out. Ten, the band 10% of this money we just collected. Why don't we do 50 fit? Or let's let's work something out. And uh, you know, so Donnie was like, I'm out. I'm not playing for somebody else to make money. It was just you know misappropriation and stuff. So uh, I bailed, and that was it. And, and Tony left. They they already put in years and years, and you know, didn't multiple tours for no money. You know. Unfortunately, when, you know, the, the whole problem with Riot over the years is that we've never really had a break. And sometimes you have high points, you know, in your career, and it's easy to keep something together. When you have a, a low point, it's very hard to keep four or five people together, and, and problems happen, and that's what makes it so hard for Riot to keep, over the years, to keep the exact same people. My first record was with members, uh, you know, leaving. Right could almost be your own solo project, uh, but have you ever considered to change the name or something? Well, actually, we did go through, uh, when Tony Moore left back in uh, 1990, we, we considered it, uh, I considered it, but uh, after thinking about it, um, I figured that it was crazy because there was a lot of Riot fans. Um, yeah, like it was a passion project for Mark Reale, I think. Like he, he wasn't going to let it die. And, and like that, those are the best bands. Just don't let them die. Well, he, you know, this is what happens with artists because they just keep doing it. It's what they do. That's their art, you know. And you're driven by your art, and that's Mark Reale fits that definition for sure. He stuck with it. He did it. He did it most of his life, and he just kept evolving in certain ways and he didn't really give a fuck. He just kind of did what he wanted to do and what he felt was right and try and do something new all the time. And at that point, you know, it, it really seemed like, uh, you know, that it was almost a solo thing in a way. Um, but I decided to try to keep the riot spirit going, so we just kept on with it. So then we got Mike DeMeo to sing, we got Pete Perez on bass, and a lot of lineup changes when nobody's making money.
different formations and different eras of Ryan? Um, they're all good. Like them all. Like um, they're all. They all got their own like quirks and stuff, but it all works for me. We like uh, every period of them. Uh, the first era. Uh, later albums or even uh, the last album, you know. Uh, there are so many different versions of Riot, like they had five different singers in their career and each of these singers uh, gave some unique parts to Riot. For example, the older stuff like Fire Down Under is so much different than uh, Thunder Steel and uh, Privilege of Power and the 90s stuff is different as well and the voice. So that uh, makes Riot also special. They always got amazing singers in their lineup that uh, makes them better than the rest of all the other bands. Every three years a new singer with another problem, I think. Yeah. I like all of them. But, yeah, Tony Moore, but he only do two records. Then came Mighty Mail. He has another voice, more bluesy style, like a little bit of Red Forest again. Yeah. And they were more in a hard rocking way, and not in the Thunder Steel speed power metal. Um, they got on their smaller labels and the, the lineup. It was a great lineup. They had great songs, but I don't think it was exactly 100% what the fans were used to. Um, they liked a little more of the power metal, so that's why in that era of the band, it's their talented musicians, but it's a little, you know, it's a little different than uh, how it was in the first uh, two eras of the band. The music with Tony Moore, Thundersteel, Privilege of Power, it's like, what is this? Now he's cutting edge again. And then when Tony Moore left, we get Mike DeMeo in the band, so Mark starts writing more like Whitesnake. And so what are we? Are we a speed metal? So you kind of lose certain bits of your following. In Germany, they love the, you know, in Japan, the, the Thundersteel stuff. And but now we're playing more bluesier based. So I think, you know, that, that it's hard to label us and characterize. Well, what are they? You know, Metallica is Metallica and, and uh, Cinderella is Cinderella and Whitesnake is White. But what, what is right? How do you... Who are you selling this album to? But Mark didn't care. It was just, uh, whoever the singer, I'm going to write good music for the singer. Whatever happens, happens. It was a totally different kind of singer. Yeah. You know, I love the way he sings. You know, he's more more of the David Coverdale kind of yeah, yeah. thing, which I personally love a lot. But, um, you know, there's always roots there. I mean, I grew up with the, with the original classic rock bands like Purple and you know, then Lizzy and, and that whole kind of thing. with Tony's voice, I'm not going to try to sound like Tony. I'm just going to do the songs the way he did it, but in my style. And so I hope the Japanese fans like that. I mean, it's like, I'm not going to try to sound like anyone I'm not. I like Tony's voice. I thought he had a good voice, but I'm a totally different kind of singer. And with the new stuff, it's just, uh, just I'm, a, I'm approaching it in a different way, the way Tony was. Mike has a a lot of lows and a lot of highs in this voice. Yeah, it's real dynamic. Which is I was going to I was going to add this this thing about it too is, is that you know when when obviously when we consider Mike the being the singer, there does have to be certain elements that he has in order to do the old material. Uh, not so much that he sounds like Tony, but you know, I mean, his vibrato and his range. I mean, he has a good natural range. as Tony has really, you know, and it's really you can really you know structure it in a way. It's a song where it's very dramatic, you know, you can really mess around with dynamics a lot. And especially when uh, in the in the Mike DiMeo uh, era of the band, they did not get the respect or the attention they deserved back then, and they, they played to uh, small crowds. When I remember I seeing him on stage, it was a small club. If I remember well, we were uh, something around 200 people there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I remember we went to Oxford and we went 
a crowd of 20 or 30 people and that was really poor for a band like Riot that they don't got the attention that they really earned. with different people he's like a chameleon he adapts to them he's like kind of like and gets the best out of what they have to give very important i always collaborate uh i like to collaborate because uh, I, I feel that we come out with better material that way in rehearsal we just got together and mark would come up with an idea and he was loose with it he would say just come up with a good part as long as it fits it's fine with me and that's easy to work with somebody like that because in the past I had to work with a lot of um, different kind of people and a lot were very strict in saying you have to do this, I have to do this. But it was a really easy album to record, it was fun. Whereas well, this time I approached it where we went into the studio, like he said, I had an idea or something. I'd start jamming and he'd start playing and we'd just hash it out that way like a band. So. It sounds like a band, it comes off like a band. put an artist or a musician into a box, into a genre box. But I think that's just done because it's, it's convenient to compartmentalize people, music, genre. Forget about the genre. Forget about whether or not you should perceive music as colors or shapes or modes and numbers. It doesn't matter. The intent is the important thing. What do you think? That's good, right? Call now, tell him. What, you trying to change that? No! Oh, he's telling me he's gonna laugh some shit. No, leave it. Without a doubt, leave that. It's fucking crazy. It's because it's different. You know what I'm saying? It really jumps out amongst everything else. That should definitely be saved, I think. This is where we plan our business from. What do you have to say, man? Smoke production, right here. Happy fucking smoke production. This is what we do at Riot recording sessions. Get out of here with that thing. Come on, we're making a movie, Riot documentary here. You got nothing. You know, Rod, through here, you, you look like David Letterman sitting at his desk, because those lights in the back look like the city, kind of, through here. Can you twirl your pencil? Flint's? Oh, the coffee of Flint's. For me? Yeah, who is it? Give me that thing. Hello? Wait. Hey. Oh, yeah, here you go. Go. Hold on a second. What do you press? It's going. It's going? So what do you want to do? Hey, Flint's, is this going? I can't focus. Hot pastrami. Flint's. Onions. Is that the mayo on the phone? Did he see the burn magazine? Did you see the burn magazine I brought in? I got, bar, I got two magazines from Japan. Tell him his gut's bigger than his chest. He says your gut's wider than your chest is. <laughs> he gets in the friggin' band, he's got great long hair, you, right? Now, then he, he, no sooner he gets in the band, he cuts his hair off and he gets fat. He's a fucking Republican. <laughs> what? How do I bring this lens back? These buttons on top? 
Yeah, it was small. They I'm only pulling out, like, man. A two or three page spread. It was kind of, it was kind of stunt that. Steady cam. I don't know. Flint's brought this in and it's running, so I'm just walking around with it. This is Green Street recording, by the way. My favorite note is A. This is part of the A room where many riot records were done. Powerful amplification here. A Lab Series L11 and a vintage 1970 150-watt Marshall. Being used simultaneously by Mr. Mike Flintz. The Amps of Doom. What? This is Flintz listening to the clunky track he laid down the other night. It clunked out, so like... It was a scratch. I'm zooming in on the spatula. Play lick, man. Is that thing recording? Does it say record in the corner? Yeah, you had it on, right? Very tasteful, man. I got it ready, Mark. <laughs> oh. <laughs> what is that? Are you gonna describe what that is? The punch angel. That's the punch thimble, man. <laughs> the punch thimble. To, pr to protect Roddy's finger from overusage. Good. You, you did a very last no, but uh, we have a couple of good endings. Well, the other one's better than this one. All right, let's go over this one. Mm -hmm. well, we need a good last note. Turn that end the solo. Send them on that note. You got that? Flint's don't know how to end the solo. How to end the solo. Something, you know. Can, I, can it overlap? One note? Yeah, anything. Just end it on something definite. You, you haven't had a definite ending yet. I'm, I'm freaking out by the time I get to that. He's so into it that he just can't, like, capture the vibe, man. He's just, like, freaking out. Like that, right? Yeah. That's what you told me to do. That's what I thought, right? Doesn't that's that make more sense than like in one of those lines? Not that that was a good solo, but it ended right. But it ended right. What are you trying to get? I know to resolve on. That? Dun da 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 no, we were gonna end it before the B flat. That's okay, because you, you're you're overplaying the. Uh... No, no, I. I... No, you that, want you that, want. What you just heard, I did. But where are you trying to resolve it on the C, or you're playing into the B flat? If I if I hit a C on that riff, it still doesn't sound right. That's what I'm saying. You're saying it's a C, but it's really a. No, it's Whatever that. that is. No, it's not that. Whatever it is. It's G to B. No, it's just. It's G to B flat to C. Because, you know, if you end on the da 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 bam, that's where you should end. <laughs> One more time, man. One more time. No, get this off tape. I don't want to have this on tape. Yeah, Flint! Okay, for everybody watching this, this is the real recording stuff yeah, that goes on. To this, too. I'm, I'm, this is not stage. <laughs> is that the way it ends? Well, he just wants to end on that C. You know, da 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 da
Okay. That'll suffice. Thank you. And we developed a kind of, you know, with the Deneo material, we developed a lot of twin guitar stuff, like more involved stuff. why the last two records didn't come out in the States is just because of the incompetence of the people that were working with us. There's no reason why they shouldn't have come out in the States. I had told a uh, uh, production company head to, to go to Metal Blade, to go to Brian Slagle in the States and have, it, and have it released, but he just, you know, they were very, very um, incompetent in terms of handling the business. It was a very, very bad situation. Well, for instance, the reason why Bobby Jozombek left is he was frustrated, and he was just uh, tired of this, this confusion. We had canceled the tour here a few years ago. Actually, we didn't cancel it. The, the agency we were with uh, really caused the whole thing to fall apart, and it, and it, caused, it almost broke the band up because uh, it caused a lot of misinformation over here about Riot. Uh, there was things being said that we didn't want to come to Europe, and we wanted all kinds of money, which was completely, utterly untrue. It was our agency that was trying to get more money and, and they just didn't want the tour to happen is what it boiled down to and uh, after that is when I really started proceedings to get away from them they had Mark lock, lock, stock and barrel you know and the name for a very very long time and I'm not sure what album it was but those two producers were bought out and they were, Mark was able to get away from their you know their clutches I guess the last two years we were in a major legal mess battling to get out of those contracts and, and thank god we finally did over the summer we finally made a settlement and we're free now so this is the first record that i've actually had full control over hmm. so it was important that, that this one definitely lived up to everything else to, you know to prove that it was always the band that had the credibility and not not the, the producer or the, or the production company or anything like that and Bobby's back again because of the fact that we are no longer involved with that production company and we have new people working with us. Well, I just want to say that we love you all. Uh, you're the best fans that we could ever imagine to have. We've had a lot of uh, problems in the past, taking a lot of time because of legal problems and everything, and you've always stuck by us. And uh, we just thank you from here, and we really hope to be back soon. Let's go.
some people, you know, oh, I don't like the DeMeo years. Oh, I love the DeMeo years. And it seems like our fans kind of, uh, they'll, they'll break down the music to different styles of, based on the singers. I love every singer equally. You know, they were all great. So, Bryant's been blessed with great singers. Mark wrote for the singer, but, you know, it was sort of like, he still had the same sort of formula, I feel like, which was fast tempo, high energy, and melodic vocals, and then like, you know, this, you know, solos, dueling guitars. No, that's what Riot is known for, absolutely ripping, stunning guitar work. That's, the, that's a steady thing through the different types of styles, whatever it may be, like if it's power metal, if it's bluesy rock, whatever, you know, it doesn't matter. Like, there's always virtuoso guitar work. That core, I, I sort of formula, yeah. sort of stage. I agree, I, yeah. I, I agree with you. I think all the albums were all the singers. I, I could see a common thread. But uh, it's just when we read reviews and, and from fans and some people, oh, you know, if they like Guy Sparanza, oh, Red Forest, and we don't like that, oh, Riot's only Guy Sparanza. And then when we, you know, some people just like the Red Forester. You have the fans of Fire Down Under and Down, and they're rock fans. They don't like double bass drumming. There's that school of people, and they only love that. And they're, like, not interested in anything after that. And then there's people that are interested in the middle period that aren't interested in either bookends. It's just a different type of band that had a lot of with different personnel and different eras and different styles. But that's what you get when you have a band that's been around for, like, almost whatever, like 40 years or something like that, you know? Yeah, I, I feel like there's also, like, people who grew up with a particular era of Riot. They're, like, really attached to that era. And like people who are discovering like Riot Five now are younger, and they're just like they can appreciate all of it because they don't have like this emotional attachment. Well, I, you know, this was part of my youth. You, you know, I think that's, that's definitely also part a of good it. point. That 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 pretty much explains it. Everything he made in Riot, it wasn't it wasn't just repeating the same trick. It was doing different things, and all of it, in my opinion, was amazing. Even like the the, the records from the nineties, they don't get much love, and I don't get why. Yeah. They're amazing on their own. Actually, I like all the the eras, the different eras of, of Riot. And also the, the more hard rock uh, albums with uh, Mike DiMeo. Uh, it's also, it's, it's different, but it's 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 also on a, on a high quality level. With a band like Riot, you have so much variance between all of this music that you can really, just depending on what mood you're in, get every kind of flavor from them. And that's something that that I that I really appreciate. And it gives me an opportunity to deep dive into albums, some of the later albums that I didn't really hear when I was just really into that, uh, the initial, you know, first three to five albums of the band. You know, he played some really good stuff. I, I got into some of the stuff with, like I said, with DeMeo. Yeah, Mike DeMeo is an incredible keyboard player, and he's an incredible singer. Some great stuff. Yeah, I checked out, um, they did an album called Danish Moore, I think it's called, uh, yeah. and there's an Irish connection there, I'm from Ireland. Uh, that singer was quite good, I quite liked him. It reminds me of like, um, that era kind of reminds me of a Deep Purple. Um, a lot of influence from them, I think, in that. There are things like the older, the older records that you have to explore. Yeah. That's great. It's like Danish Moore, I love Danish Moore. Okay. It's, it's, this is another, side of them yeah that i like very much yeah i do too i like the demeo stuff
Sparks writing is, uh, you know, starting to fit in better with the way I sing. We, we're kind of complementing each other much more, and I feel much more comfortable, you know, as a member of the band. I think when I first got in the band, a lot of the fans still were used to Tony's voice, and there was a lot of that, uh, you know, people wanted me to sound kind of like him. So I think that uh, fans have started to accept me more now. So. I think we've developed, this, I, you know, I found his sweet spot in terms of keys to write in, melodies, and we've developed a good collaboration. So it's growing. Metal Blade claims that uh, you have captured the feeling from Fire Down Under with uh, your new album Inishmore. Uh, have you gone back to your roots? Do you feel that yourself? Uh, I think somewhat. You know, I think what this record does, it kind of captures the whole, it kind of encompasses the whole, the, all the records that we've done in, in some way. I think that if you if you took somebody that's never heard the band before and try to give them an example of what what it was about, I think this record would be a pretty good example of that. Let me walk out! great songs on it yeah the, the mark reality that he played heavy rock and he was a great guitar player but he was focused on the song and and i think that that, that comes through and on the albums we had songs you know it wasn't just somebody screaming over a guitar riff the bridges the choruses and the pre-chorus and uh it was always about the song make a good song you know Is that good? Yeah. <laughs> 
first thing. That's oh, one. the first bend. Okay. But the original one, maybe because you just did it once. That's the first take. It just gets so much more feel. There's less noises between the notes. The pitches sound great. There's more angst in the playing. The da da da. I think we're the best on this one. Sure. But bending those half tones is rough. Getting on pitch, I think. So just come in after like that low shit. I think the first song has it all over. All right, here's number one. The noise is cool. And I just don't want no out of tune notes though. <coughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't think there's out of tune notes here. I think you're talking about very blue blue notes here. <laughs> That's a better idea. I'll just do that again. Uh, can you put it in perspective in here more? Yeah. Like, can, let me hear some of the reverb and put it more in the okay. mix so I can hear yeah. if that, that's like working. Do you feel that the band changed after you joined? Um, possibly a little bit. My my background is is not singing heavy metal. I was singing like White Snake, Led Zeppelin type of stuff. You see, the thing is, I don't think that we really are a heavy metal band anymore. I consider us more like a hot hard rock band. Yeah. You know. Mm. Um, kind of like Purple when they had Coverdale. Yep. Kind of that era. You know, when they did Thundersteel and Privilege of Power, those were heavy metal records, you know, to me. Yeah. Do you like the tracks that are on those albums? Oh, yeah. I, I'm a big fan of that kind of stuff. It's just that I don't have that kind of voice, you know. Mm. You know, I love to do the songs live, like Thundersteel and stuff. <laughs> not my style um, when I do write it doesn't come out that way you know it comes out more like angel eyes type stuff or yeah, yeah. Or, t or twist of fate you know something kind of bluesy like that <laughs> Well, you were singing? Yeah. yeah. That, that second line is kind of almost really cool. Did it take? Play it again. That's cool. Do you know what the second line is you sung? Let's try to get that one. Well, let me fuck around with it. Are you going to another track or something? Yeah, it's fine. I mean, none of this is good, but just... Well, there's certain things in here that are kind of like going in the right direction. <laughs>
he was getting sick of uh, sick sick of having to play to be pigeonholed. He actually wrote a song with, with Tony Arnell from TNT called Pigeonholed because Tony Arnell f went through the same thing. They wanted him just to sound like TNT and for the rest of his life, just sing like that. And Mark wanted to expand and he just wanted to be a rocker and he didn't want to have to always shred. You know, he always liked blues and rock. And so yeah. Westworld was a band that he has with Bruno from Danger Danger and Tony Arnell from TNT. And, Straight up rock music. It's hard rock. It's very melodic, of course. It's uh, a little bit more straight, uh, straight ahead rock. It's not as up tempo as Riot. It's more, more a bit heavy, but but medium tempo kind of stuff. Another outlet for what's inside. Great band, yeah, great band. Mark Reale was uh, was was wonderful to write with, and so generous, and um, he really allowed me to be very free. I brought a lot of ideas to the table. He, I could literally hum a riff to him, and he would pick right up on it and run with it. And uh, you know, just a very kind, sweet, um, you know, generous person to work with, and a hell of a guitar player. record had to do with us getting canceled last minute on our dream tour. DeMeo and myself, you know, it was a whole big thing in 2000. We were going on the road across America with Ronnie James Dio. It was going to be our biggest thing. And then, you know, Mark made it, you know, of course, a couple of fighting, you know, me and DeMeo were very upset about it. We, we canceled the tour three days prior to leaving. Mark pulled the plug, uh, Half, half because of the money, you know, because, oh, by the way, instead of making, you know, $500 a night, you're going to make $300 a night for the whole band, you know, or something like that. Yeah. And, and the rest of us was like, okay, well, we're already in it this far. What's the difference? Mark said, that's it. I'm done. I'm staying, going to stay home and mix my Westworld record. And, put a, and that's when the first West, Westworld. So we kind of didn't, the only time I didn't, we didn't really do anything for like six months to a year. We were just like, the hell with this business. I'm sick. I'm done. That was the closest I was to getting out in 2000. That's why I cut my hair off. <laughs> but he, the day after he canceled the tour, uh, I just went to the, I went to the barber. And I, I said, I'm done with this. <laughs> that was my moment where I was like, I'm out. I'm going to stay home and just teach my guitar lessons and play in a cover band. I can't do this anymore. So we first B-section first and then the chorus. And I, uh, this was all going to be acoustics up until then. I was thinking of like, you know, all this stuff, like on the acoustics. And then when he picks up time, having two more acoustics coming strumming over that, I was going to try to make it real big, you know, big drums, bass, and just acoustic thing happening. And then when the first chorus comes, the electric guitar will kind of come in to some degree. So the thing is, you know, acoustic friendly chords, you know, closed F chord isn't as nice as a G chord.
In the late 00s, I um, booked Riot at a club called Don Hills in New York, where I used to work. I had them play with a monthly uh, all-girls metal show called Bitch, so it was kind of a big turnout. Basically what it was, was like he'd get 30 girls and they'd all want to sing just one song that they specialized in. And it was all like Iron Maiden, you know, Wasp. It was all heavy stuff, you know, um, Slayer even or whatever, like all heavy stuff, all really heavy stuff, all by girls. And they would get dressed up and look totally off and crazy. And he called me in to do the gig. So I did a couple of months of that. Riot also apparently played Don Hills. I think. Oh, you... yeah, that's right. I forgot all about that. We played there, too. Yeah. And uh, that went really well. Yeah, people really dug it. That was really early on. That was like one of our like first gigs as, as a new lineup. I remember talking to Mark before the show, and he was very kind of quiet and reserved, but a really nice guy. And I remember Mark getting there early and just spending the entire day downstairs just playing his guitar. And he would have guests. Different people would come in, radio people. He had a number of like high profile guests come and talk to him and stuff like that. Yeah. Uh, I guess the Outlaw is one of the fate, my favorites off of uh, Fire Down Under, Warrior off of the first record we ever did, Rock City. And of course, Thunder Steel has a couple, Thunder Steel itself, the title track, and a song called Flight of the Warrior. I like Kings of Falling, Angel Eyes. Wow. Then Lizzie, <laughs> one of my favorite bands, I might add. Uh, when he got up on stage, he opened with Swords and Tequila, and he played Narita, and, and it was all that. And he was, he was on fire. There, 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 there was a small contingent of people up front who knew every word. And then this was like a Wednesday night at midnight. So it was pretty diehard. We had a very, very exclusive riot show with Mark Rielli. That was the last time we had him here uh, at Keep It True. We are very proud to have this legend at the festival. The set list was simply perfect, playing all the classics in almost two hours. We were not allowed to film back then. A friend of ours filmed it, Rainer Krukenberg. After two songs, the manager came and smashed his camera. So nobody has seen this footage yet. Greetings, Keep It True fans. How are you? This is Frank Gilchrist from Riot and Riot 5. 2006, Keep It True 6 was a very, very important show for the band because we still had our founding member and visionary Mark Reale with us. And I know that Mark thoroughly enjoyed the show and appreciated the amazing response from the fans. So that's a memory that will live on forever for all of us. And we thank you for everyone who was there that night and made it possible. So from New York City, riots! I want to show you something I picked up. Oh, oh, well, thank you. Wow. I heard the, yeah, that they made an LP version of it. That's they crazy. did make an LP version. It's High Roller Records. Yeah, in that's... Germany. They put it out in 2021. And uh, it's a 
It looks like this. Wow, yeah. I, I haven't even seen it, tell you the truth. That's the first time I'm looking at it. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's a good album. We just wish it was recorded and uh, we wish it was mixed and produced better. But, you know, I, I finance that myself. We have always talked about re-recording it. Well, they, they, it says here, mastered by Patrick Engel at Temple of Disharmony in May 2020. So they may oh, have I, remastered I have, it. I have to hear the remastering. Yeah. yeah. So the story of why Riot didn't make it as big as they should have or didn't uh, get the exposure that they really deserved and the recognition that they deserved, uh, it's a long one. If you want to learn more about it, um, there's a film called Fight or Fall put out by The Metal Voice, which really gets into the nitty gritty with different band members and the management that they had. It's also Martin Popoff's book, Swords and Tequila, really well researched and detailed. Both are fascinating explorations of uh, the riot history. Just your perception Tear it down 